Hey everybody, welcome back to the Dungeon Dive. Daniel here. Okay, and welcome back to a little session report on a D100 dungeon uh, using the new World Builder expansion. So I have just completed my first quest and man, it was so much it was so much fun. I was having such lucky rolls on all of my tables and combat. It was probably the luckiest game of D100 dungeon I've ever had. Um, yeah, very cool. And gosh, I gotta tell you, with this world builder expansion and the way things are shaping up, I think this has the potential to be a top ten, top twenty game. Uh, yeah, it's it, it, it's it's really really cool. So um, if you guys remember the last episode, we kind of created our starting world here, where we had our grasslands of horror. This is the terrain where our hero Hindar was from and the city was called Evervamp and our first quest quest number one was over here in the forest of elves so uh, Hindar he traveled to the forest of elves to undergo his first quest and that first quest was to retrieve three items, three um, armor items, and deliver them to an exile who is uh, starting to study armor. He, he wants to become an armorer. So we went down into the depths of the dungeon to find the exile some pieces of armor that he could use to learn on. So we went down into the dungeon and here was the results of our uh, dungeon mapping game here. And this was the entrance here. And uh, we went ahead and went this way first and it was a dead end. And then we just kind of followed around here. We found some stairs here that led to a lower level of the dungeon, but we didn't go down. And we came up here. All of these green stones represent uh, searching. You can search each room one time. And because this quest was hand in and it didn't necessarily say loot, we could, any time we rolled on table A and found something, then that could count for our quest. Some of the quests in the original book did say loot, and you specifically had to loot from monsters. But this just said hand in, and so anything found or looted could be used. And table A is all of your armor. And so we found a few things throughout our quest that we could use to uh, hand in for our quest. And then we came over here. We had some trouble over here with these really hard locked doors. I didn't find any keys. and I only had two doors in this entire dungeon. Um, so, but we just kind of ignored those doors. Uh, this trap triggered and hit me. There was a trap here was pretty cool because it was like this falling rock on the on the dungeon tile and it was actually a cave-in trap so that was fun and finally we found our last treasure that we needed when we defeated this goblin warlock encounter number eight here and um, anytime you can roll on the a table or actually that wasn't the one it was um, it was, I think, this goblin here. That was the second to the last one. Anytime you can roll on this A table, that is what we needed to um, get the A table. The TA table is, a, is actually a different table. So we had a couple lucky finds and a couple lucky looting experiences, and we were able to, um, to find everything we needed to solve this quest. On my time tracker here, you'll see that uh, we went through the whole time twice, so I needed to eat twice. We finished on the second turn of the third round. We used uh, seven flasks of oil, ate two food, and we used one pick to try to um, unlock one of those doors there. And then on my little tracker here, I have this little symbol is a reminder to use oil. And then the exclamation point is a reminder to roll for a random wandering monster encounter. And so we ended that, and can we ended this uh, quest here with uh, finding 140 gold and treasure. We found a ton of spells, and my guy is not even close to being able to use spells yet. 
So um, I'm going to be selling all of those spells for quite a bit of money when we go back to the settlement. And luckily, we also found a legendary, legendary necklace of the bear, which gives us a plus five strength. So that really helps with uh, him being a warrior and boosting that strength. So that was a really cool and lucky find there. And what else did we found? We found a male coif, so a, like a chainmail hood. So that could have been used for one of our quest items, but I decided to keep it because I did not have any uh, armor on my head. And so that was a really nice piece of armor we found. It came with uh, three pips of damage and it, um, it had an armor of class of two. So whenever you find an item like a weapon or a piece of armor, there is a chance that it's going to be damaged when you find it. And you roll a d6 and you apply that many number of pips of damage and then when you go back to a settlement well then you can actually repair that piece of gear for spending a certain amount of gold and the items that we found in order to uh, use for a quest we found leather arm guards a leather helmet and a leather girdle so we are going to erase those i'm gonna do that right now and so we handed those off to the um to the exile so they can get their uh, business started and uh, repairing armor maybe and we also found some other items that we can sell such as an uncommon rat kidney a brew of greater intelligence a spider head a spider foot and an abacus so we can sell that for uh, looks like around 300 or so gold there um, we did end that quest with uh, going down to 15 hit points. I was able to, let's see, where's my quest? Um, where's my, I'm trying to find my quest combat sheet. So I also was able to find a potion that I drank right away that gave me a plus one to my primary health. So my health is now 21. Uh, my total health is now 21. And I also was able to um, improve a skill from fighting enough monsters in the dungeon. And the skill that I approved um, was lucky. I rolled on uh, number eight. So I added a plus five to our lucky skill. And that did actually come in handy a couple times. So the monsters we encountered in this first dungeon was a giant rat, a goat man priest, goblins, another goat man, a giant spider, another giant spider, an orc, uh, tricksters, and some goblinoids. Oh, and then I also, I don't think I put in that last goblin warlock. I forgot to add that. So I'm going to go ahead and add a goblin warlock to my... Um, combat track. So now the next enemy we defeat will actually give us a plus one to our primary strength as a reward. Very cool. So we need to head back to the settlement now and I thought that I might do some of the settlement phase. Oh, oh yeah, no, I did want to talk about one thing. So one really cool thing, I am going to kind of uh, push this stuff to the side here. We don't need this anymore. One really cool thing is there is a connection between the questing part and the world part when it when you are dealing with time and I really like this a lot. It's very creative and quite easy easily implemented. So time does pass when you are in the dungeons when you are on a quest you're not really tracking off each turn as a day as you would on the overland portion. But every time you fill up this track once, so every time you have to eat some food, you check this little um, track here on the bottom, the quest time track. And every time you check off a one on that little calendar date, well then you have to mark off a day in uh, on the calendar. So the time down here is basically one complete rotation of time. Uh, two complete rotations of time is a day's worth of time in the real world. And then as you do that, your character does get fatigued. 
And so when you check off a one here, when you check off a day on your calendar, you are also going to uh, fill in a pip on the fatigue chart. So when you come out of like a long kind of arduous and dangerous quest, your character will have some fatigue from that quest and some time will have passed while they are down in the depths of the dungeon. That is super cool because it doesn't just, you're not just playing these kind of like two separate parts of a game that are separated and that don't have any influence on each other. There, that element of time, that element of bookkeeping is the thing that kind of melds the two parts of this game together. And I think that is super cool. So we are um, here in the Forest of the Elves, and we do need to do some movement. So um, movement is you calculate your movement from the, from the hex you are leaving, the terrain you are leaving. So we are leaving a forest there. And so if we look at our, at our um, chart here, it's going to tell us how many action points aka how many days it's going to take for us to leave this terrain. So let me find our um, terrain chart here. So here's our terrain chart, chart of forest. It's going to cost five action points. So that's going to be five days to head out of this forest. However, because there is a road and because we are following the direction of the road, it's actually going to cost us, I believe, two fewer. And um, let's see here, let me find that. Yeah, it's two fewer. So it's gonna cost us three days to follow this road, to head back to our um, grasslands of horror and to go back to the Evervamp um, city where we were from. So on our calendar here, we're gonna mark off three days. So one, two, three. Okay, so now we are in our city, our starting hex. And now we can take what they call, let's see, what is the name of that um, action here? Would be a camp or settlement action. And it costs one action point, so one day's worth of action. So mark off another day here. And so we are now in our city, and now we can perform what you would normally perform on the in-between quest phase of D100 Dungeon. But now we perform that using our world builder book and we're going to use one of the more complex charts here and that is the settlement chart and this is pretty cool so this has all of the steps that you want to take such as refresh your tracks um, then step two is healing step three is repairing items step four is selling items then step five buying needed you're buying from the end table in the original book Okay, then you can search the market. So you can search for items on specific tables. You can do training, which is how you improve your skills and your primary stats or your hit points. You can learn a spell. Um, here you can invest in the empire. You, know, you invest in the overall land. And then if you have your expansions, which I'm not using, you can do your witchery or your artisan. And then you could also search for more quests. And finally, you have a chance of having an event. So each of the different types of settlements, you have a camp, a village, a town, and a city. And each one of them has a increasing percentage chance of that service being available for the listed price in the book. At one end of the spectrum, you have the city. So the cities are the biggest settlements. Everything is always available in the city. You never have to roll to see if something is available. And it's always for the price listed in the book. As you go down in size from city to town to village to camp, each of these steps becomes one harder to find somebody to perform that step for you in the settlement. and if they are available, then it becomes more expensive. So you are better off trying to do your settlement phases in cities. So as you can see here, so um, you don't do refresh the tracks at, at, a, at, a, at a settlement, 
but you do start with number two, which is healing. And so we can restore our lost HP for 20 gold each. So I think we should go ahead and do that. We need um, six points of healing. So that's going to bring us back up to 21. And then what is that? Uh, 20 points each. That's going to cost us 120 gold. So that leaves us with uh, 20 gold. But that's okay because I have a ton of stuff to sell. So now we could do repairing items. Okay. Um, I'm not going, I don't really have enough money to repair any items right now. But now we can do selling items. And I'm going to do the selling and buying off camera just because I don't want to sit here and go through charts with you guys. It's not that exciting. Um, now, each one of these, so it cost me a whole day to go into this settlement and do all of these things as, um, as, as needed down this list. In order to participate in this settlement again, I need to leave the hex and return. So uh, eventually I will sell some items. I will buy some needed items because I'm going to need to buy some more oil and, and uh, food and that, and that kind of stuff. We can search the markets if I'm looking for something in particular, maybe some kind of weapon or armor. I'm not sure if I'm going to be training right now. I'm not sure if I'll have enough money. I'm not going to be learning any magic. I'm not going to be investing in the empire. So then we're going to come down here and we're going to look for quests and events. So in a city, we have a 50% chance to hear a rumor of a new quest, um, perhaps, um, and we would discover that quest on a hex outside of the city. So let's see if we hear a rumor. Um, 96, so no. So we have discovered no new quest. Now, if you have a law score other than zero, there's a chance that you might get arrested or something. My law score is zero, so we don't need to worry about the law in this city right now. The final thing that you want to do on a city is you want to have an event. Okay, so there's an 80% chance that we're going to have a random event. I'm going to roll and hopefully get that. But if I don't get it, we're just going to say that we're having a random event because I want to have one, especially on camera here. All right, so let's see here. Um, nine. All right. Too bad that wasn't a skill roll. We could have uh, upgraded. I had so many lucky skill rolls in that dungeon. I was rolling so low when I needed to roll low and really high when I needed to roll high. It was awesome. Okay, so we are going to have an event. Super cool. I was hoping we would have one. Well, I was going to cheat and make us have one regardless, but we came about it honestly. So we're going to turn to our um, event page here, and this is our main event table. And we are in a settlement here. So now we are going to um, figure out what kind of event we are going to have. Okay, so let's roll here on our percentile die. So in the settlements you have, you follow this column here. And 81, a brawl is going to break out. Okay, so we're going to turn to the brawl entry to see what that's all about. Some brawl in the city, maybe at the tavern or something. Okay, Brawl. The adventurer is drawn into a fight and must perform a series of tests until either the adventurer or their opponent is knocked out. During the tests, you will be generating a KO number. The KO number begins at 5, and if it reaches 0, the adventurer's opponent has been knocked out. Alright, so we'll keep track of that with a D6 there. Okay, however, if the KO result reaches 10, the adventurer has been knocked out, so it's kind of a tug of war. There are three types of tests the adventurer may choose from. However, the same test may not be performed in succession. If the fight isn't going the way the adventurer would like, they may, of course, draw a weapon and attack. See the attack event. Okay, so we can turn it into like a deadly confrontation, or we can just have this brawl. So we're just going to probably have this brawl. So let's see what happens here. I'll do most of it off camera, but we can do one on camera here. So we can do a strike, a dodge, or tactics. A strike is a strength test, and we can use our strong skill. A dodge is a dex test, and we can use our agility skill. Or we can use a tactics, which is intelligence, and that is the aware skill. So do I, I do not have a strong skill. 
but I am, I do have a 65 as my value in strength. So we're going to go ahead and say that we're going to use, uh, first we're going to strike and 89, 86. All right, so that did not happen. So we failed. So we're going to add one to the uh, KO total. Okay, so we can't do that again. Uh, my next highest strength um, is probably dodge. So we're gonna dodge a blow. I have a dexterity of 30 and this is going to, um, we can use our agility, which I don't have either. Maybe I should use my, I'm actually going to use some tactics. I'm gonna to try to outsmart my opponent because my intelligence is also 30, but I can use my aware, which I have a plus five. So this is going to give me a 35% chance to do this. And there we go, 24. Okay, so that's minus one, so we're back down to five. So now I can use strike again. And 97, oh man, I'm like pulling my punches. Um, so now we're back up to six. All right, so now let's go to um, tactics again. And 50, nope, okay, so now we're up to seven. So I'm going to complete the rest of this off camera so I'm not just rolling a bunch of dice. I'll see you guys after this testing is done. Okay, well that was super unfortunate. Um, we lost the brawl. However, I did roll uh, one really good strike. I rolled under 10 and using strength. So that allows me to um, invest in my strengths more. Anytime that you take a test in this game, anytime you see something like this that is a test, even in combat, if you ever roll 10 or less on a percentile roll, then you get to upgrade that um, ability that you used or that skill that you used and so my strength I'm about ready to um, pretty close there to upgrading my primary strength which is super cool but we did lose that brawl and now it's going to get even worse okay so however if the adventure was knocked out they suffer 1d6 HP worth of damage okay so let's see uh, two okay so that takes me down to uh, 19 hit points here after I was all healed up Okay, and they may have some of their items stolen. There's a 50% chance after knocking out the adventurer, their opponent will steal some items. However, this will increase to 75% if you're directed here from the robbed event or if this event is linked in any way to the pickpocket or stolen mounts. It is not. So um, if we roll under 50% uh, here, something's gonna get stolen. Uh, 38, damn it. Oh my God. Okay, so uh, <laughs> we are going to have to go to the stolen items event now. So as you guys can see, these events are awesome. I mean, they're not just like little simple kind of rolling on a chart and see what happens. They, they can be intertwined. They can have effects on each other. Often bad as you, <laughs> as you guys can see. So um, let's see, what is this? Stolen items. Some of the adventurer's items are stolen. If they are not already numbered on the adventure sheet, number the backpack slots on the back of the adventure sheet as follows. For items with damage, um, one to 10, for items without damage. So it's from my backpack. So right now in my backpack, I have, um, six different, I have uh, five different items. And these are items that I probably would have sold already, but for the sake of this example, we're just gonna say that they could be stolen. Okay, you must now make four checks to find a random item stored in different sections of the adventure sheet. The sections are as follows. The equipment slot, you roll a d10, the belt slot, and the backpack items with damage track, okay, and the backpack items without damage track. The following rules apply. If a section hasn't gotten any items, there is no need to roll, and the thief steals one d10 plus 40 gold instead. If the section is just one item, there's no need to roll and you can remove that item. If the section has two or more items, you'll need to roll until an item is scored, then remove it from the adventure sheet. Once each section has been checked. Oh my God, so it steals from every section. That sucks. Okay, well, what is gonna get stolen here? So we may have to like uh, spend actually some of our money to um, buy buy an item that, that was gonna get stolen. So we have in our section up here, these are the numbered slots one through 10. So let's see what gets stolen. Uh, eight, studded, studded leather belt. All right, so that is gone. Okay, so that wasn't too bad. I don't mind losing that studded, studded leather belt. 
it wasn't that great. It was only worth about 300 gold, so we can easily we can easily replace that. Not too worried about that. Okay, on the belt slot, we only have one thing, and that was a brew of, uh, I think, Lesser Dexterity. So that is gone. They stole that. Our backpack with damaged items has nothing. So what does that say? They steal some gold. 1d10 plus 40. Okay, right now in this part, since I've skipped the sell phase, I only have 20 gold. So that's probably a little bit beneficial for me there. So that is gone. And then finally, in our last section here, we have one, two, three, four, five. I'm just gonna roll a D6. Four, one, two, three, four. Okay, and he stole my spider's foot. Okay, so I got into a brawl in the city streets. They knocked me out and then they looted my body. So now I'm going to perform the rest of the settlement phase. I'm gonna go shopping, I'm gonna sell, get myself some more health potions, some more oil, probably try to get some kind of belt again <laughs> so I can uh, replace my stolen belt. And then we're going to, um, that'll be the end of the settlement phase and we'll head off on to quest number two or quest number three. You don't have to do them in order. And then maybe we'll explore and find some, uh, try to find some new uh, terrain, some new hexes and see what we can find. But I did just want to show how cool now the in-between quest part of D100 Dungeon is with the World Builder expansion. So, all right, guys. Well, we'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.